Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. Good, I hope. Good. So there's an exam in seven days and ten hours or something like that. Um, so your papers will be, there's a few of them yet to be scanned. They'll be scanned soon, today probably. And then uh, all the keys are posted, all the relevant keys are posted with the exception of quiz six, which will be on the exam. Quiz six is overwritten homeworks like probably like written homework 26 th or no written homework 27 through 32 something like that that's what quiz 6 is over and those keys are posted <coughs> okay <coughs> so the way the exam will go is you'll report to the room and I'll I'll let you know what room it's going to be it's going to be on a big in a big lecture hall uh, on campus so I'll send a message when that it, when when you're given your room assignment, you should find that room before the exam. Okay, it would be silly to be walking around uh, trying to find that room while you're supposed to be taking the exam. Yes? No. No. What the cutoff for the material for the exam is two weeks ago. Uh, is is last week's homework is last is last week's homework so the, the the written homework that you turned in on Friday three days ago is the cutoff for the exam <coughs> other questions okay so today is the tenth And last time when we left, we were talking about families of functions, so let's finish that thought. <coughs> okay, so I'll go through the first two families quickly because that's how far we made it. So the first family is lines. So there's two members that we'll consider. The constant lines, the constant functions, and the non-constant kind. So this <coughs> first one is a function like f of x is a constant. So that means that you can plug in any value that you want, a million, a billion, pi, whatever, it's always going to give you a constant value C. And when you plot such a thing, it looks like this. Okay, <coughs> the other kind is f of x is mx plus b. <coughs> such lines are sloped. Now there's one kind of line that's not represented here. What kind of line is not represented here? <coughs> the vertical kind. So will I include vertical lines in my list of functions? No. no. Why not? It won't pass the vertical. Wouldn't pass the vertical line test, right? It would it would intersect with itself infinitely many times, which is too many. Okay. So the next one is the power family of functions. And we talked about these last time, so I'll just zoom through them. So all of these are some power of x. So x, 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 x. And this first one is x to 1, and then x squared, and then 
cubed and then fourth and then fifth. So when you draw them, x to 1 looks like this. Sloped line. So it kind of, in a sense, belongs to both of these families. <coughs> x squared like this. So unlike the line, both sides of it are above the axis because when you square an x, even if it's negative, the output will be positive. Okay, so output is uh, the vertical coordinate. Okay, cube looks like this. So it's kind of like someone took the x squared and then twisted its left arm down kind of like that. Okay, because you can cube something and it is still negative. If it was negative, it'll still be negative. Like negative 10 cubed, well that's negative 10 times negative 10, which is positive 100, times another negative 10, which is negative 1,000. Okay, x to 4, well that's, a, that's an even exponent, so it'll be like the cube, except the arm is twisted back up. So in that way, it's like x squared, except it's, even fl it's flatter near the origin and steeper away from the origin. And then x to fifth is like x cubed in the sense that it's one up and one down. But it's like x to the four in the sense that it's even flatter near the origin. Okay. So now... If I was to plot one of these for you, I'd expect you to be able to tell me the following kind of thing. I would not expect you to be able to look at this and say, is this x to the 4 or x to the 6? I don't expect you to know that. But I expect you to be able to tell me, is this an even power function or an odd one? It's even. And there could be no mistaking that. Because all of the even ones have the same behavior on both sides and all the odd ones have opposite behavior on either side. Okay? So after the power family of functions, it's the radicals. So all of these would be a radical of x. So radical x, radical x, radical x, radical x. And what will change is the specific radical. So this is 2, 3, Four, five. So I'm calling this second radical, but what's what's a far more common name for this? Square root. Square root right. Okay. So when you draw this square root, it looks like this. Something like that. So why did I not draw anything on the left? Because the square root of x has to be greater or equal to zero. Right. The argument. The x. The input has to be greater or equal to zero. So I, that, you know, we, we talked about that analytically, but visually, what the way that manifests itself is that when you're drawing square root, you can't draw anything on the left side. There's nothing over there. Okay, so for the cube root, like this. So notice that there is something over there now for cube root. Because, for example, what's the cube root of 1,000? 10. 10. What's the cube root of negative 1,000? Negative 10. What's the cube root of 27? 
3. What's the cube root of negative 27? Negative 3. Okay. Fourth root is in its way like square root. Okay, because it's only drawn on one side, but it's flatter near the origin. And then it's uh, also flatter, it, it's more vertical near the origin and more flat away from the origin. Okay, and then fifth root is like cube root in the sense that it's drawn on both sides, but it is like fourth root in the sense that it's starting to become quite flat. Okay, and this pattern continues, this, this parity pattern, even odd, even odd, as far as you would care to take it. And I expect now that you, I, I could give you a drawing Okay, like this, and I could say, well, is this, is this a line, a power function, or a radical? It's a radical. Okay. Is it an even or an odd radical? Odd. It's an odd radical. Okay, but I would not expect you to be able to, to answer the question, is this the fifth root or the seventh root or the ninth root of x? <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> but, you, but it's quite clear that it's an odd radical. Okay, after the radicals is the reciprocals. Reciprocal, like this. So by reciprocal, I mean that every one of these is going to be of the form 1 over x. So 1 over x, 1 over x, 1 over x, 1 over x, 1 over x. And what will change, what will change is the exponent on the x. So this will be 1 over x to 1, 1 over x to 2, 1 over x to 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> OK. So let's start with this one. <clears throat> so imagine x starts getting big, like million, billion, trillion, things like this. It it's going to get closer to zero, right? So one over billion is pretty small. Mm -hmm. And then one over billion, billion, well, that's, that's even smaller, right? So as you go to the right, as x starts getting very big, the, the one over x is going to start to become still positive, but close to zero. Okay. Now, what if, what if x is positive? That's to say you're on the right side. x is positive. Uh, but x is starting to get close to 0. Then what? So, like 1 tenth. That's 1 over 10. What is 1 divided by 1 over 10? 10, right? Because 1 divided by 1 over 10... Okay, that's going to give me 10. Because division by 1 tenth, so the, closer it is to zero, the, bigger it is. the bigger it gets, right? So if I make this a bigger number, like, um, you know, 10,000, 1 divided by 1 over 10,000 is 10,000, right? So the closer you get to zero, the bigger 1 over x gets. So the reciprocal function on the right looks like this. So 
as you go to the as you start moving to the right it starts getting very flat and close to zero but as you start getting close to zero the input starts getting close to zero but positive the output starts going to infinity right it's kind of like you know this is this is what's happening when you start getting close to a division by zero right no 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 <laughs> and then it starts escaping right to infinity now what will happen on the left then It'll be, yeah, it'll be similar, similar thing, but it'll have to be in the bottom left quadrant. Why will it need to be in the bottom left quadrant? Well, it'll have to be on the left side, because that's what we're talking about. That's negative inputs. Why will it have to be on the bottom? Because it has negative outputs, right? So it'll look like this. So that's what the reciprocal function looks like. And you can see it's got some interesting stuff, right? It, it's not connected at zero. So this is kind of a visual representation of, of you know, what can go wrong when you divide by zero. Look what happens <laughs> when you get close to dividing by zero. The function kind of loses its mind. From the left, it goes to negative infinity. From the right, it goes to positive infinity. OK. So now, how will 1 over x squared be similar, and how will it be different to 1 over x to 1? It would be much like closer like okay. to the intersection. Okay, so I think you mean that it'll, as you move to the right, it goes to 0 faster. Yeah. Okay, I agree. What else? Would it be the top left quadrant and the bottom right quadrant? Right. Everything's going to have to be on the top. Why is everything going to have to be on the top? Because it's uh, Right, because we're squaring. So that means that all outputs must be positive. So everything's going to have to be on the top. So it'll be kind of like I take this, it'll be like this one, but I'll take this left branch and, and flip it up so it'll look like a volcano. Okay, but even besides, besides flipping both arms up, there'll be even yet another change. It'll be like if both arms are flipped up, then I'll squeeze this part like it was made of toothpaste, and all of this toothpaste will, not all of it, but a lot of it will squeeze up into near the y-axis. So the, so the area that's near the x-axis, I'm going to squeeze it, and it's going to go to the x, to near the y-axis. So the result will look like this. So it's like a volcano, both sides are up, and I've kind of squeezed the area near the x-axis, and it's moved nearer to the y-axis. Okay, now how, how will x cubed be similar and different? It'll right, it'll, it, has, it now can have negative outputs, so it'll be like this left arm has flipped back down, and then it'll be squeezed even more. It's hard to draw it right by freehand. But at any rate, what I want you to observe is that even though 1 over x to 1 and 1 over x to 3, they're both odd, so they do have this opposite behavior. But this one is symmetric. This area is symmetric. But this area is asymmetric. OK, and then it just continues. So now, given any one, of, any one of these is all, I should be able to hide whether or not it's a power or radical or reciprocal function and not give you a formula for it. And you should be able to tell me that, well, this one is a line, or this one is a power function, or a reciprocal or a radical function. And you should be able to tell me it's parity, even or odd. Any question about these? 
Okay. <clears throat> so next thing. This is section 3.3. Something like rates of change. Okay, so we need a definition. So let F be defined, defined on a, B. Okay, definition one. The net change of F on A, B. is denoted delta y. So that is a Greek letter. It is shaped like a triangle, but it is pronounced delta. So it is delta y, and it is f of b minus f of a. So this is the left endpoint, or sorry, the right endpoint minus the left endpoint. Okay, two. The average rate of change of F on A to B. is, so two things, three things really. So delta y, I'm just copying this from the previous line. Delta x is b minus a, and the average rate of change is delta y divided by delta x equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So we've got the average rate of change and the net change. And notice that the net change is the numerator of the average rate of change. Okay, so we haven't done an exercise yet, but is there any question about this definition? Okay, we're going to do an exercise in a minute, but I need to give one more thing. As a picture, this is the story. say that this is the plot of F. So now I'm going to select two points. Select two points on F, two different ones. So here's one, and here's one. Okay, then I'm going to say that this is A here. B. And what I want to know, so first off, so that means that the x coordinate of this point is A. What is the y coordinate of this point?
So if this red line is F, the plot of F, and this is and this is input A, then what's what's the y coordinate here? F of A, right? F of A. So that means this is f of a. If that's the case, then what's this one? f of b. OK. Now, this horizontal distance here, what's the horizontal distance here? b minus a. And how are we, what, what is our name for that, b minus a? Delta x, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And what's this vertical distance? Yeah. F of b minus f of a, yes. And our name for that is delta y. Okay, and what we're saying is that average rate of change is delta y divided by delta x. So now, to make the story clear, is now I'm going to take these two points. Remember the way the drawing was made. It was, okay, I select any OF, I drew it. Then I selected any two different points. And then the rest of these things were consequences. So now I'm going to draw the line which passes through the two points that I selected. I have a question for you. What is the slope of this line? One. It's not one. Delta y over delta x. It's delta y divided by delta x. It may in fact be one because of the way I drew it. <laughs> okay, but supposing I drew a different picture, it would be rise over run, right? Delta y divided by delta x. So the slope of this line is delta y divided by delta x, which is to say the average rate of change. Change has a g in it. So, the average rate of change is the same as the slope of this line. The same as the slope of this line. And this line is so important that it has its own special name. Does anyone know the name of this line? Bill. Bill. <laughs> Fred. <laughs> no, so this kind of, such a line where you take a plot and you select two points on it and draw the line connecting them, this is called a secant line. Secant line. So for those of you who have taken any trigonometry, you will have heard the, the word secant before. And secant line is not related to the secant trigonometry function. They're not related. They're actually both, in turn, related to something else. Uh, in, the, in, in this case, what the relation is that the word secant means to cut, like section, dissect, that kind of thing because what the secant line does is it cuts the, the function into pieces. Okay? So any question about, uh, about this? Okay, so now, now I can finally ask an exercise. Now let's do it on the next page. So is everybody okay with this? So, let's, 
let f of x be 3x squared minus 5x plus 2 on the interval negative 1 to 3. Question 1, please find the average rate of change of f on negative 1 to 3. Is it one? I don't know. <laughs> I just made I just made up numbers here. I have no idea. Well, so in the end, what I want you to do is that I want you to compute f of three minus f of negative one divide by three minus negative one. That's what I'm asking you to do in the end. Okay, so I'm going to evaluate each one of these pieces individually. So f evaluated at negative 1. If I plug in negative 1, that's 3 times negative 1 squared is 1, so that'd be 3, and then plus 5, and then plus 2. Okay? So that would be 10. Okay. Well, that's just a coincidence. Uh, this would be 27 minus 15, and then plus 2. So that would be uh, 14. And so f of 3 minus f of negative 1 over 3 minus negative 1. Well, that would be 14 minus 10 divided by 4, which is 1. one. So it just turned out to be 1. It's just a coincidence. It could have been, could have been anything at all. Okay, so any question about this one? Okay, so question 2. Find the slope of the secant line of f on negative 1 to 3. What do you think? One. Why, why one? This is the same question. Yeah. Average rate of change is the slope of the secant line. They're the same. But in a, in w when there are synonyms like this, from, from the instructor's point of view, I have to ask both questions. Because imagine everything that could occur, right? Student could answer this one correctly and then just say one. Right? So that, that sort of signifies to me that, okay, student, student knew how to do this and also understood that this one was the same as this one. Okay, another thing student could do is, is do this and then say, I have no idea how to do this. Right? I have no idea. And what that signifies is that student has failed to connect the two concepts. And, th and then it just gets worse from there, right? So student does this, does this one and also this one, and then gets two different numbers. So that signifies that student failed to connect the concepts and also made at least one arithmetic error, 
right? <laughs> okay? So, so on a question like this, almost always, both of these are requested. Okay, to check, to see that you've connected these. Okay? So suppose that I give you a table of values. I'm just going to make some, I'm just making stuff up here. Hey, my first question to you is, find the average rate of change of F on four to eight. Okay, so how'd you do it? Okay, good. So it's the same story as before, right? So now it's going to be f of 8 minus f of 4 divided by 8 minus 4. That's what I want. And so in this sense, this question is actually even easier than the previous one. Yeah, because you, you don't have to do any arithmetic. You don't have to evaluate a function, right? You just look it up in a table. Okay. So this would be... 31 minus 13 over 4, and that would be, uh, what, 20, uh, 18 over 4? So 9 halves, 4 and a half. Any question about this? Okay, so now I won't bother writing it down, but I'll just ask it aloud. What's the slope of the secant line of f on the interval 4 to 8? 4 and a half. Same thing. 9 over 2 is 4 and a half. Oh. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. going to draw some points. And I'll say that this is that this is f plot of f. And now my question to you is: um, first question, draw the secant of f. On negative two to five. So 
But what am I asking of you? Mm-hmm. Right. So does that? I guess that means from the first point to the last point. Okay, good. Right. So not. Why not this point? Why don't we start here? Right. So I want you to do it from x is negative 2, from x is negative 2 to x is 5. So this is x is negative 2 here, and this is 5 there. So in, in the end, what I'm asking you to do is to connect these dots with a straight line. That's what I'm asking you. Any question about the first request? Okay, how about find the average rate of change of f on negative 2 to 5? Okay, so how'd you, so 3 over 7. Okay, good. And how'd you come up with that? Okay, good. So then, remember, average rate of change, you could do it by saying, well, what is f of 5? f of 5 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So f of 5 is 5. And what's f of negative 2? Two? 2. So that would be 5 minus 2 in the numerator, and then divided by 5 minus negative 2 in the denominator. So you could do it like that. f of 5 minus f of negative 2 over 5 minus negative 2. And you could say that's, what do we say? 5 minus 2 over 7, which is 3 sevenths. You could do that, but there is another way which, I, it de I don't know, depends on the person whether or not it's easier. You can also just do it by looking at the plot. Because remember, how is average rate of change related to the secant line? It's the slope. It's not, they're not the same, but it's the slope, right? So we can just look at this line and just count, right? So what is its rise? 3. So delta y is 3. And what's its run? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You could also do it just like this, right? Uh, other way around, right? Whoops. Any question about this exercise? OK. <clears throat> so another thing, need a new definition, we have to consider. <clears throat> so first, f is said to be decreasing. on an interval when a less than b implies that f of a is greater than f of b. And this is on the interval in question.
Okay, so this is typical of a math definition in that it is exactly correct, but it can be a little bit opaque about just what it means. So let's suppose that we have two numbers, A and B, and that A is less than B, and that we're moving from A to B. So these are input values, so these are the horizontal ones. So would we be moving left and right? Le would, we, would we be moving left or right if we moved from A to B? Right. We'd be moving to the right, because B is bigger. So this is saying, move right. So now, these are output values, y values. So now suppose that we move from f of a to f of b. Would we be moving down or up? We'd be moving down, because where we started is higher than where we finished. So we'd move down. So a function is said to be decreasing when, if you were to be looking at it, every time you move to the right, you move down. That's what it means to be decreasing. So as a picture, decreasing could look like this, or like this, and so many other different ways. So notice that if you, if you keep your pin on the red, keep your pin on the red, every, and you have to stay on the red. Every time you move to the right, you move down. And that's what it means to be decreasing. What do you suppose the next definition is? <laughs> Increasing. So now what will it be? Every time you move right, you move up. So I'll just draw the picture because I think you can imagine the language. If every time you move to the right, if you have to keep your pin on the red, Every time you move right, you have to move up. Okay, and we'll talk more about this on Wednesday. Have a nice Monday. Are the two graphs like after the shift? I don't understand your question. Like, is this representing a shift? No. So, a function is Increasing because this is because, because this is the input. So as the input is increasing, the output is increasing. So you start here and you move to the right, you increase the input.